So it becomes extremely important, like, you know, okay, well, which team should I double down on? Or which team should I wind down? Which project should I wind down? <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome Thank back you. to Statistic. Yeah. It's good to have you. I it's good it was... to see the company after a year. <laughs> yeah. I think the last time you were here, we were in the Kirkland office, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was a... You have about uh, 10 to 15 people. Yeah, now we have over 45, 46 people. So <laughs> okay. It's grown quite a bit. By the time you post the video, it'll probably be 50. And how much uh, you'll grow by valuation and revenue? I think, so the last time we were at a Series A, so yeah. we raised a Series B. You probably saw we raised uh, $43 million um, at a pretty good valuation. So mm -hmm. we're pretty happy. Do you have, have real customers now? Right? Yeah, we have lots of customers now, so we're pretty, um, we're doing well in terms of like customer attraction. Um, you know, it's one of those things where early stage, mm -hmm. you, when you're building the company, first four or five months, you get, you're worried if mm -hmm. anyone will want to use your product. Yeah. Every founder's nightmare is that, right? You build a, something that you believe in and then you wait for somebody to come and use it. Yeah. Uh, and then when you actually have people coming in and using the product, the next stage is like, are they going to pay? Yeah. for the service. So getting paying customers is uh, the next level of validation. And so that was nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. um, but then once you get one of those, then you write a contract and kind of like, then it becomes like, okay, whatever we're building is actually still valuable for people and to the point where they're willing to pay uh, a good amount of money for a contract, which is great. And then the next step is like repeat Return. that, like, you know, mm -hmm. make them, make them feel like the tool is valuable, uh, retain them and then grow that, make it into a repeatable motion and so on. So, so far we have been very fortunate uh, to get a lot of customers that find value in what we're building. So when did all those steps happen? Yeah, I think um, over time. Um, so I think our first- When well, first, uh, last interview, I think you were like two, three months into building the company. Yeah. So and our first months. contract, how, when did it come? So the first customer came uh, four months in. Uh -huh. um, oh. So that was, a, I think, um, Take app, which was a, a small app that was built by an ex-Facebook engineer uh -huh. uh, in uh, Singapore. Uh -huh. uh, and then he launched it. And then we started seeing traffic. Uh, so that was great because first time ever we saw you know, customers use our product and then the end users using the product or uh, feeling the effect of the product, which is great. Um, and then about six months in, we got the first major customer, um, and that was Headspace, and they were uh, trying the product out. And there was also an ex-Facebook uh, team that loved the product, and mm -hmm. kind of like they missed uh, the know. tools inside Facebook, right? And so it was good to, to, to have that kind of validation, and then that subsequently ended up in a contract and so on. Uh, and subsequently, like, you know, one of the good things is um, the, the ex-Facebook, ex-Uber, ex-Google, um, ex-Airbnb, uh, these folks have used tools like this before yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, they miss the tools. And so when they see Statsig, it kind of resonates re really well. And I feel like it's not only do they miss the infrastructure, miss the, missing the tool, yeah. they also have conviction of uh, what the, the tool can help them achieve. Yeah, yeah. And um, that is important though, because mm -hmm. um, having an intuitive feeling for uh, how profound these tools can have an impact on your product culture, product shipping culture, the velocity mm -hmm. which you ship, and even to the element of like, you know, engineering happiness, um, because instead of like debating mm -hmm. your product features on the merits of like your debate, you actually are able to um, test it out. Everyone can have ideas, everyone can have autonomy to test something out in production and then if the impact is there, then it stays. If mm -hmm. the impact is not there, you you wind it down and then you move on. Yeah, um, it's such a powerful way of running um, or building software, and the cultural impact doesn't stop with that. I think it's it like continues on. Like you know, I remember when I used to uh, set up goals, and the goals for the end of the half used <laughs> to be like shipping goals, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Oh, by the end of this half, I'm going to ship these features, and then I remember at Facebook we never talked about shipping things. It's yeah. always about like what impact, impact did it have? Yeah. Did it actually meaningfully... If you sh ship uh, garbage, then yeah. you just uh, did right. garbage work. It yeah. doesn't matter, right? Yeah. So I think it's important to like, okay, did we add value to our users, to the customers? And how can we quantify that uh -huh. um, becomes important. 
I remember like uh, seeing this number in the trustworthy online control experiment. Yeah. Like ninety percent of business business ideas are either negative or just ins uh, insignificant. Yeah. yeah, and I think we saw very similar uh, numbers at at Facebook too. Yeah. Um, I feel like unless you're really good, you know, <laughs> in product sense, I think there should be a level of humility yeah. to have like you know maybe we don't know everything that we don't know about how customers are going to use our product um, mm -hmm. and I think a good way to think about it is like you know one third of the features you believe you ship mm -hmm. are going to be positive for mm -hmm. your metrics one I third think. are going to be neutral uh -huh. and then about a third is actually hurting yeah but if you don't know which one's the <laughs> third then yeah, you don't know don't. we don't yeah. we never know right yeah. I remember like another uh, another Twitter uh, like uh, from uh, Novell, like the famous Angelis founder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he developed a mental model about the complexity of decisions, and uh, his sense is just humans are very bad at making complex decisions. Yeah, especially if there's an element of subjective, like you know, look, yeah. I came up with the idea, and I feel so personally invested in the idea. Yeah. It becomes very hard to like without data yeah. to be able to like you know actually make the right decision. Yeah. Now, the with the current economic climate, it's also it becomes extremely important like, you know, okay, well, which teams should I double down on or which teams should I wind down or mm. which projects should I wind down? It's it's important like, you know, if you just go and wind down the projects that are actually beneficial to the product, that's, yeah. that's actually worse. For yeah. it, it never hurts to like understand the impact of the effort that you're putting in. Yeah, I feel like A/B testing is the ultimate tool for achieving intellectual honesty. I think so. Now, one thing I would say is like, you know, A-B testing is the, the, I think the state of the art, yeah. the way to identify which ones work, which ones don't. Now, but the problem with A-B testing uh -huh. is that it is a time consuming process. Mm -hmm. The process of A-B testing comes up with like, first you have to come up with a hypothesis and then you have to build a variance for those validating those hypotheses. Then you have to ship those variants. Mm -hmm. And then you have to allocate samples, isolate the experiment, run the experiment for like, I don't know, two, three weeks, depending mm -hmm. on like how many samples you have. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have your data science team go back and analyze it and then, you know, verify it mm -hmm. all to like whether you uh, validate or invalidate the hypothesis that yeah. you originally had. That entire process takes so long that most people don't run experiments as many times as they should because mm -hmm. then the, what they do is they save the big decisions for experiments and the rest of them they rely on product intuition or the convenient decisions <laughs> yeah right, right. and yeah. so I think it becomes important to like for tools to make it so simple yeah um, it should be automatic the whole idea of like every code feature release should automatically be subscribed into an a B test mm -hmm. and the tools should take the work or the burden mm -hmm. of like analyzing those and giving you back numbers yeah. um, that you can then use to make product decisions. Is that the biggest selling point for Statsig? Yeah, so the, the idea behind Statsig is like, we think that A-B testing is great, but yep. A-B testing is such a time consuming and manual process that uh, most people don't run as many A-B tests as they should. Mm -hmm. And so it is it is the important for a tool like Statsig to come in and say like, look, you focus on building features because that's what you're really good at. That's what yep. you should be spending time on. Mm -hmm. Let the tools mm -hmm. take over the idea of like, you know, okay, any time we see a rollout, mm -hmm. and that is that generates an opportunity for us to go in and understand, okay, here's a split in an otherwise statistically random sample that we can take the people that are exposed to the feature as your treatment mm -hmm. and the people that are not exposed to the feature as control. Let's compare. Yep. Let's compare the, all the metrics, the hundreds of metrics, and then see if there's any statistical differences between those metrics. Mm -hmm. And that is useful information for yeah. you, right? Yeah. So that gives you, because why would you build a feature in the first place? You would build a feature because you believe that feature is good for your users, something. or customers, or business, or anything. Mm -hmm. Something about that feature is good, and mm -hmm. that's your hypothesis. Yeah. Let's validate that. So I, I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, I think both are linked to your market size or your total total addressable market. The first question is, uh, kind of, how many of your current customers are ex Facebook, ex Google, and ex Uber because they have all used A/B testing platform? Yeah. But uh, I found it is difficult for people that never use this kind of A-B yeah. testing platform to realize the real, the value behind it. Yeah, so this is a really interesting question because 
whenever we talk to someone new, um, we can quickly tell if we're selling, uh, you know, in, in the realm of uh, selling, right? And then, are we selling a Tylenol or are we selling a vitamin? <laughs> I'll explain what that is. Like, you know, um, Tylenol is a painkiller. Uh -huh. So imagine someone comes to you and says like, look, I have a headache and uh -huh. I need a Tylenol. It's easy for you to like, look, here's a Tylenol. Yeah. Here, it's solved for your pain um, and I can sell it to you. Whereas a vitamin is a little bit different because you have to first convince people that it is important for you to have the vitamin. But the moment you try a vitamin, then you okay. feel the benefit of it and you're never going to, you know, not want it. And uh -huh. so... Um, when we talk to like the the ex Facebook, ex Uber, ex Airbnb, it, it is very clear like they they realize the value intuitively of a tool like Statsic, yeah. and it becomes a much easier conversation. Yeah. Um, and then when when we talk to uh, the other set of folks, there is an element of like for us, we have a lot of awareness to build. We need to like um, be out there, do some content, uh, build, some, write you know, write blog posts, and go to conferences and talk uh, to educate or to build awareness for a different way of uh, building, measuring, and then using the data to mm -hmm. inform your product decisions. And that is a large market, mm -hmm. and that we are starting to slowly um, build up. Yeah. But for us so far, the um, the success have come from you know the people that already understand the value of the tool. Mm -hmm. So it, we're super early. We're only like eighteen months in. So right. right now we're kind of like in the you know we're happy just serving the Tylenol market. Yeah. Uh, eventually we want to uh, address the vitamin market. Yeah, I think it's uh, just uh, it, it is just a very hard problem to solve. Yeah, like getting is. people to realize the value of vitamins. Yeah. No, it is and. And there are companies that have done that really, really well. I think, um, you know, even just feature flagging, right? You know, yeah. some of our competitors you know, have done a pretty great job of like convincing people that feature flagging is a great way to build products. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, it decouples code shipments, uh, code releases from feature releases. You don't have to tie those two things together. Mm -hmm. And that's a very powerful concept. And so, the people be before us have done a pretty good job of like bringing awareness and now it's on us to like build the awareness to the next level which is like it's not just enough if you just put pe you know features behind a feature flag it's mm -hmm. important for you to understand how each feature is performing mm -hmm. is it beneficial for your customers your users your business you talk about the competitors uh, what is the biggest difference between you and the other like optimizely and uh, i think there are a couple uh, a split right? yeah so um, like I said, one of the things that I have observed um, was the whenever people talk about product experimentation, the state of the art is A-B testing. Yeah. And that's where it stops. Yeah. Um, whereas what we all learned inside Facebook is like A-B testing is, is great, but it's, it's, it, it um, favors precision over decision. Uh -huh. um, and so what ends up happening is people obsess so much about like the precision of the A-B test and in practice, what ends up happening, you need to be making a lot more product decisions. And so where Statsic comes in is like, you know, automates the entirety of like running an A-B test so much so uh -huh. that we believe that when you know, our customers are now running 10 times more experiments than they were running before. I see, the efficiency of uh, running yes. experiments. Simplicity it, even. Yes, so the, the biggest, um, differentiators are how simple our tool is for you to like just get those metrics right away two lines of code right well so yeah. Into, yeah and 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 then everything else flows from there the second part is you don't need to occupy your data science team mm. to like constantly be analyzing and making product decisions mm. the engineers the product managers and the designers can make these decisions using statsic and what it does is like it's pretty important because it's hard enough to find good data scientists. Good data scientists are, see, the thing is, you know, there's yeah. not very many. It's very difficult. And then what happens is most of the companies that we talk to hire these great data scientists, and then what do they put them on? They put them on, um, go analyze this A-B test. Yeah. And what, you're, what ends up happening is these, these teams of data scientists are looking backwards and analyzing and diagnosing and and running queries on uh, an experiment and then you know making like okay here's a report and mm -hmm. make your product decision 
Instead, those people, I mean, obviously, I don't think people enjoy doing that. They should be looking forward. They should be like analyzing, okay, what should the product be mm. going forward into versus mm. like looking backwards. Mm -hmm. And so what Statsik does is also relieves these data scientists from you know, the grunt work and lets them do creative work, which is what everybody wants to do. <laughs> yeah, as a data scientist, I really thank you for Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's this important. Like, you know, uh, we, we see so many of our customers like, you, you have such an amazing data science team, but what are they doing? They're doing grunt work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is a very good angle, like yeah. uh, looking backwards versus looking forwards. Yes. I think other great data scientists wants to you know, help shape, shape the future shape of the company. Shape the future, strategy, yeah. what the product should evolve into, not what the product was already done. Like, you know, yeah, so, Better uh, decisions. Yeah. Looking at the past is only taking information for the future. Not, Correct. Yeah. Correct. Exactly. All right. Okay. The second question also about your total addressable market. Uh, we know at Facebook it's very, it's very easy to do A/B testing yeah. because of the traffic size. Right? Yeah. You have billions of uh, uh, billion of people using the. Oh yeah. But uh, it's not uh, the case for most companies. Yeah, yeah. Then how? Yeah, this is a common myth. Um, yeah. The myth is that you need to have large sample sizes like Facebook in order to run experiments, um, and I, I think that's that's not true at all. Um, See, so if you're looking for 0.01% improvements in your MAU or DAU metric or your revenue metric, then you do need millions of billions of samples. Yeah. The, obviously, you know this better than anyone else, which is in order to get sample size um, or the, um, what is the, the statistical sample power, yeah. you yeah. have yeah. two factors going and there's the uh, minimum detectable effect um, and then uh, the baseline conversion rate as well as the sample size. The, it turns out that the minimum detectable effect has a much higher bearing on like the your statistical power. And so when small companies with like only a few thousands of samples, what they're looking for is 10% wins, 20% yeah. wins. They're mm -hmm. not looking for 0.01%. If you're, if you're a small company with only 1,000 samples, if you're looking for 0.1%, I would say like, yeah, you should stop. You should like <laughs> go look for larger wins. Um, and so when you're looking for 10, 20% wins, you don't need millions of samples. That's true. Yeah. And, and so we, 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 we have to bust this myth because you know, this comes up a lot of times. 39% of our customers are our B2B companies. Mm -hmm. And B2B companies, they don't have, when, when, when they generally talk to us, they're like, oh, we don't have that many um, samples. And how do we run experiments? You can definitely run experiments. And these are all like still valid. I would still say like, look, you should still put every feature uh, behind the feature flag and then still validate the impact of those features because sometimes what happens is you introduce a bug without really noticing. And those bugs have this massive 100%. MDE. <laughs> yeah. And those those MDEs will manifest itself as a, as a, as a change yeah. with statistical significance instantly. Yeah. You don't have to wait for two weeks. It'll, you'll get back that right away. And you should be looking at that and capturing those and then fixing the the bugs and mm. not wait until like your experiment is done yeah. uh, to look at those. So I, I generally say, you know, it would be beneficial if the entire data science community comes together and it's like actually busts this myth uh, yeah. that you need to have large lots of samples. Yeah, I remember at Facebook, I always tell the engineers, uh, don't look at the, the final metrics revenue and make his yeah. at first look at adoption at different uh, layers yeah. and that often tells you more uh, information than oh absolutely um, the that's another good technique where you look at the top of the funnel mm -hmm. and uh, correlating metrics you know things that are that have less inertia things that can move right away mm -hmm. um, it's also a pretty good um, you know way to pick the right metric for how you measure the success of your own product mm -hmm. you know sometimes if you pick two too deep of a funnel metric. Say, if you pick at the bottom of the funnel metric, you know it's very hard to move those metrics, mm -hmm. and you don't know if the if the work you're doing is actually impacting. Sometimes people pick like you know 30-day average metrics, and then the, the, those metrics have inertia. And what mm -hmm. happens is like you know you, whatever changes you're making don't immediately manifest. You have to wait a long so time it for it to see. So my general philosophy is like you know pick top of the funnel metrics generally the ones that are correlated to the ones that you want to move. And if they're moving in the right direction, then that's a good sign. Yeah.